Hello, and welcome to week 12, Philosophy 101, in which we will be discussing John Searle's book, Mind, Language, and Society. Now, before I get into John Searle's approach in this first chapter, I want to go over kind of his overall agenda and the way he views things. Now, John Searle is a prominent figure in philosophy of science, but this is not a philosophy of science class, and I believe I state this later on in the lectures as well. This is an introduction to philosophy, so I really want to focus on his epistemology, his aspects of knowledge, and that's why we're reading the book on social reality or how facts become social reality. So that's really the agenda of this entire book. He wants to go over and kind of investigate how we create social facts. Now, for John Searle, there are basic facts of science, which is you know, chemistry, physics, particles, atoms, these, these very physical properties at a fundamental level. Those are basic facts. But there are also social facts. It is a social fact that Barack Obama is president in 2015. It is a social fact that the New England Patriots won Super Bowl 49. These are objective social facts, and they exist just like there exists objective basic facts. But for John Searle, he disagrees that basic facts and social facts are independent from one another. On the contrary, John Searle believes social facts are arise from basic facts. We somehow go from electrons to elections, from protons at the basic level to presidents. And that's what this entire book is focused on understanding. Now, the first four chapters, and we are going to skip chapter three, but regardless, the first four chapters contains the information we need at a fundamental level in order to create a social reality, and chapter 5 contains the bulk of information on how we create a social reality. And how we create social reality is what we are going to focus on in this class. You can challenge yourself to find the instances where he talks about or discusses how basic facts, protons, electrons become things like consciousness, become things like intentionality. So I wanted to make sure I put that out there, that the bulk of the information is going to come from chapter five. Obviously, if you skip straight to chapter five, you're not going to understand what he means by consciousness and intentionality. And I will quiz you on the highlights of chapter one, especially what's found in the reading guidelines and the understandings of ontology and epistemology that we gather from uh, chapter two. So I'm not advocating that you skip everything. But what I'm saying is the majority of the information on how we create social facts come from chapter five and everything up till then is a buildup. So Now we'll get into John Searle in this first chapter. So in chapter one, John Searle takes a different approach than many other philosophers. Because philosophy up to this time really concentrated on arguing what he calls the default positions. Something we'll go into later. But what John Searle does is he realizes that these default positions are not theories that can be argued, nor things that should be taken for granted. They are essential parts of our understanding so that we can have understanding at all. And so John Searle takes these default positions as necessary, and then he moves on from there. He will bring up Descartes, he will bring up Hume, and he marches forward to produce what is considered one of the most important books in philosophy within the last century. 
Yes, this is a philosopher who is still alive. While I was in the San Francisco State, I often heard of John Searle because he was right next door at California, Berkeley. And I heard of his contributions to the philosophy of language, the philosophy of science, the philosophy of mind, and obviously the philosophy of society or social philosophy. There's a lot of information in the introduction, but I have highlighted in this lecture the important parts that will continue through the reading. So we'll start with the discussion on the Enlightenment vision. We'll discuss the default positions, reality and truth, the four challenges to realism, skepticism, knowledge, and reality, and then finally, is there any justification for external realism? And with that, we'll move on to the first slide. The Enlightenment Vision. Now, this is not the first time we're talking about the Enlightenment Vision. In fact, it did come up in David Hume's book. But what the Enlightenment Vision means is that there is a universe that is completely intelligible and we are capable of systematically understanding its nature. So what does this mean? What is this enlightenment vision? Well, if there is an intelligent world or an intelligible world, then unlike Descartes, where he believed we could be dreaming, therefore we cannot understand or certainly conclude that there is an external world, Searle says, no, there is an external world. And so that's the first part of the Enlightenment vision. There is an external world and a completely intelligible external world. And we are capable of understanding it. So he goes even further to say that even through our senses, even though the senses can be deceived, and the skepticism of Descartes proved this, we are capable of understanding it. And he will argue a little bit later on why he believes this necessarily. And obviously he does accept this because Searle states, I accept the Enlightenment vision. I think that the universe exists quite independently of our minds. And that's a strong claim because many other philosophers before him in a certain kind of skeptical philosophy called idealism states that we never know the world independently of our mind because we don't have access to the world independently of our mind. So he thinks that there is a universe that does exist independent of our mind. And again, he will state that later on in the book. This is just his beginning arguments that he's going to later on show must be the case. Searle then presents some arguments that oppose the Enlightenment vision, but then quickly states that he's not bothered by them and that he will present why he's not bothered by them in more detail and respond to the various aspects of what he calls postmodernist challenges to the Enlightenment vision. And when we say postmodernist, we are referring to a intellectual movement of relativists or those that argue a certain kind of relativism. And relativism is that there is no universal right. There is no universal morality. We create our reality. You know, we create knowledge. So everything is subjective. And that's why I was saying subjective is very important. It's a very important concept for us to understand because subjectivity and objectivity play important roles in Searle's book. So we need to have a strong understanding of what is meant by subjectivity and objectivity. When something is subjective, its truth 
cannot be found independent of a person's taste. You know, a person's favorite team is subjective. A person's favorite food is subjective. And it's hard to argue against somebody else's favorite food because if somebody likes pizza and they say it's their favorite food, to argue against it is to fall into the same old degustibus non est disputandimus. You know, it's uh, when matters of taste are the concern, there can be no dispute or there is no disputing matters of taste. So relativism is very subjective in nature and therefore terminates itself into taste or sentiment. Now, you see how this would be a problem because if morals or law was subjective, it really only applies to those who agree with it because there's nothing else for them to hold on to. But when it's objective, when it's an objective fact, it is regardless of what you believe that creates it. You know, a mountain is objectively a mountain regardless of what we believe it is. You know, I can say, well, that mountain is a tree. Well, no, that mountain's not a tree. That mountain is a mountain. And no matter what you do, it is, in fact, a mountain. And Searle's going to play with this boundary, with subjectivity and objectivity, but I want to demonstrate kind of what's on the line here. Because up till now, postmodernist movement was very strong. And it was looking bleak that we could find objectivity, especially the objectivity that Plato was looking for. You know, that objectivity, that aspect of certainty that lies independent of us that Descartes was looking for. You know, Hume really destroyed a lot of that objectivity when he started showing the subjective nature of philosophy itself. But Searle brings to the table an objective reality that's created by our subjective taste. And I know that's a lot to take in at this moment. You know, that's a tough pill to swallow. But when we get further into the reading, you'll see how this line starts to blur. Nevertheless, it's important to know in this beginning section that the Enlightenment vision is the understanding that the universe is completely intelligible and we are capable of systematically understanding it. And Searle does not believe in dualism as well. He does not believe that there are two worlds, the mental and physical. So that Cartesian duality is not something he buys into. What Descartes said that the mind's in the body, the mind is um, non-material and the body is material, Searle does not believe that. With that out of the way, it's interesting to note that this book is an introduction to philosophy in Searle's own words, but it's a different kind of introductory book. You know, he says, you know, there, there are two kinds. The first kind takes the reader through a list of famous philosophical problems, such as free will, the existence of God, the mind and body problem, things we've already discussed in this class, you know, other than free will. And then the second type of book is really a short history of the subject, giving a brief account of major philosophical thinkers and their doctrines. That's actually the way I structured this class, going over the major philosophical thinkers as they existed from ancient time up to current time. But Searle's approach is different. He wanted to produce a synthetic book that attempts to synthesize a number of accounts of, appar of apparently unrelated or marginally related subjects. He wants to talk about some problems in philosophy and then solve them in a 
different way. He wants to bring together things we already believe and show that the philosophy or the philosophical problems we're having are solved just with like the common sense that we all believe we have because that was what Hume was saying. Philosophers are merely philosophers until they come out of the shade. You know, Descartes was sitting there doubting his own existence, but as soon as he comes out of the shade, he's still a man. He's still doing things. So Searle was like, you know, why are we arguing these obvious facts? Why are we stuck in this metaphysical realm arguing what we should really just take for granted because guess what you wouldn't be able to argue if you didn't believe these things anyway and of course this will make a lot more sense later on but it's good to have this kind of understanding that Searle believes and and hopefully this rings true that while you're reading this book you're going to say why is he explaining this to me this is common sense that, that's exactly what Searle wants he wants it to be common sense because in some aspects it is you have to have this underlying framework in order to have have theories whatsoever in Searle's own words he says he wants to advance a series of theoretical claims both about the nature of mind language and society and about the inner relations among them what the interrelations among the mind, language, and society mean or and or produce. You know, he wants to exemplify a certain style of philosophical analysis to make them clear in the course of the discussion. Then make a series of observations about the nature of philosophical puzzlement and philosophical problems, what these problems mean. So basically, he wants to do some philosophy, illustrate how to do it, and what to make some observations about the special problems of doing it, then state some of the general conclusions about the nature of philosophy. With that, we will move on to the default positions in the next slide. The default positions. So... A default position for Searle is the views that we hold pre-reflectively so that any departure for them requires a conscious effort and a convincing argument. Now, since this is an introductory class, I can rightfully assume that before you came into this philosophy class, you had a lot of default positions. One thing that I enjoyed about Descartes was the way he shook up my default position, my understanding of certainty, my belief that I was, in fact, in that class listening to my professor lecture. You know, this is what he means by the default positions, something we really don't need to reflect on, something we take for granted, and not not take for granted in a negative sense, just things we need to believe in order to function in society. You know, I need to believe that this is not a dream where I'm recording these lectures. I need to believe that I am, in fact, recording these lectures and that an audience will hear them, that I do have a set of students in my class that need to hear my lessons in order to understand the book. You know, these are these are views that do not require reflection, which is what he means by pre-reflectively known. Any departure from these positions requires a conscious effort and more importantly, a pretty convincing argument. And that's what Descartes did. When you were listening to the lecture, You didn't have this idea that your entire existence at that moment in time could be doubted until Descartes offered a pretty convincing argument. The fact that you don't know if you're sleeping or you're awake because there is no universal symbol in the right hand corner to let you know that, you know, you have entered sleeping state now. So know that you are dreaming Now, all of our senses can be fooled, and all of our senses, since they enter into our mind, can be copied in our mind in a dream state. So, 
This is what Searle means by the default positions. The ideas that you have or what you need to understand or take for granted in order to function in society. And he lists five, although I only put two in the slide because those two are really the ones that become something else as the introduction moves forward. And more importantly, as Searle moves on through his reading, these two become something more, but I will list them all right here. The first one is that there is a real world that exists independently of us, independently of our experience, our thoughts, and our language. The Atlantic Ocean was the Atlantic Ocean well before we named it the Atlantic Ocean. It exists independently of whether or not we believe it exists. So the default position here is that there is a real world and it exists independently of us. We are on Earth. We don't create Earth. If you look at my picture on the slide, you'll see a cow blocking someone who um, maybe wants to go to work or is very busy. But the world exists independently of us. You know, I don't want that cow to block me. I don't want that cow to stop me from going to work, but guess what? There is a functioning independent world that exists independently of me and my thoughts and my language, and anyone who has ever been in the country where a cow walks in front of your car and you're stuck until that cow decides it wants to leave knows exactly what I'm talking about. The second one is that we have a direct perceptual access to that world through our senses, especially touch and vision. And here you have shades of Descartes, where he said the senses or the perceptual nature through the body can be doubted, so we don't know things for certain. But we know, or more importantly, or more correctly, We have a belief that when we're touching something, there's something there that we are touching. When you're driving in your car, you have direct perceptual access to the world through your vision. If you didn't, you wouldn't be able to function driving that car. So it requires a strong argument to convince you that you are not driving right now, or you are not sitting down listening to this lecture right now. It takes conscious effort and a convincing argument. A third default position, words in our language, words like rabbit or free, typically have reasonable, clear meanings. Because of their meanings, They can be used to refer to and talk about real objects in the real world. Yes, there there are philosophers who argue semantics, that there really does not exist a rabbit. There does not exist a chair. These words that we use to describe things are just forms of language, forms of sound we use to communicate something. And they would use the fact that we create language to describe something to kind of undermine a realist argument that there is a world that we can understand independently uh, of ourselves. Because if we're just using words and the words are subjective, when I say something is a chair, I'm playing a language game with that chair because there's no essential chair. And let me explain this so that you understand what I'm saying. When I say, what is a chair? A person could say something with four legs. Well, a dog has four legs. It doesn't make him a chair. Okay, well, a chair is something that's wooden. Uh, It can't be just wooden because there are many things that are made of wood that is not just a chair. Okay, a chair is something I sit on. Well, if I sit on a table, does that make it a chair? In essence, we learn the word chair by being presented with many different examples of a chair, and then we form an idea of what it means to define a chair in our mind so that when we see other examples of it, we can label that as such. Okay, that is in fact a chair. And 
if somebody comes around and shows us that everything meets the criteria, but it's still not a chair, then we formulate our example, we change our example in our mind, and our definitions of a chair change. The fourth default position is our statements are typically true and false depending upon whether they correspond to how things are, that is, to facts in the world. What this means is when we make a statement, it is true if the corresponding thing in the independently existing world is in fact the way I say it is. So when I say there are three rocks in front of me, that is only true if there is, in fact, three rocks in front of me. And again, you're probably thinking, well, you know, of course, that's what Searle wants here. And the default positions should have that semblance of, of course it is. You know, this is obvious. This is common sense. It'll become clear why he's bringing this up later on, but for now, it's good to understand what he means by default positions. There was one more. It's um, causation. That causation is a real relation among objects and events in the world, a relation whereby one phenomena, the cause, causes another one, the effect. This directly argues against Hume. For those that understood what Hume was saying, you can now argue against this, where the causation is just an illusion we create ourselves because really we only see one event occur, then the other event occur. But again, this was a default position. You believe that all effects are caused. And then if we trace back to the cause, we can produce the same effect. And many of you might have listened to Hume and still hold the position that there is, in fact, causation. I mean, I did when I was an undergrad. The fact is, for Searle, it takes a really good argument and a conscious effort in order to not believe the default positions. And causation is another default position. But he only focuses on the two, and those are the two that you see in front of you as you're listening to my lecture. Searle goes on to state that much of the history of philosophy consists in attacks on default positions. And you can really see that because the the two I have posted, and of course causation, really reflect what Descartes was saying, what Hume was saying, and even what Plato says in the Republic. Not really what, what we studied, but in a another classic that he's known for called The Republic where the world of the senses does not instill truth. you know, And that's a conscious effort, and you're going to need a convincing argument to show me that I cannot gain knowledge at all through the senses. Because as Hume showed, you can't even think independent of experience. Regardless, David Hume's refutation of the idea that causation is real relation between events in the world is an attack on a default position and takes a considerable amount of conscious effort to understand his argument, and it has to be a convincing argument for me to change my belief on causation. You know, and then you have Descartes' rejection that we can have direct perceptual knowledge of the world. This takes a conscious effort on our part and a very convincing argument to change our default position that there is a real world out there and that our senses can inform us about the world around us. But Searle clarifies something here. He says, you know, default positions, they're not common sense. Like, you know, a common sense theory is that you better be polite to a person if you want them to be polite to you. You know, that's common sense. It's it's a matter of common opinion. But the default positions are not common opinions. They're background. They are background necessities that are needed for us to have opinions at all. You know, if it was common sense, then a person may be able to function without certain aspects of common sense. I mean, I see it all the time in my family. The fact is, is that he's saying the default positions are not common sense. You know, the real world existing out there is a necessity. It's a background. I need to believe that there is a real world out there as a background for me to hold theories whatsoever. 
I need to believe that there is, in fact, a car that can be driven by me and that there is a road there is stop signs. There, there are other people on the road. There are laws that he to adhere to. There is a speed limit that I must follow. These are all background knowledge or background certainties that I must take for granted, really, in order to function in society. And so... As long as you understand what he means by default positions and how they're really not common sense, that will go a long way in this reading. And the two default positions I point out become theories that philosophers argue against. But Searle will use the fact that they are default positions to create subjective and objective knowledge. And of course, that is way beyond what we're going to learn in the introduction, because Searle's different. He really doesn't bring up an argument or go from premises to a conclusion. This entire book isn't based around one argument like Hume really was. This is an introductory book, according to Searle, and it can be viewed that way because he maps out certain positions and then he begins talking about what those positions entail. So with that, we'll move on to reality and truth. Reality and truth, the default position. So the two that I highlighted last slide are given names. The first one is called external realism. And this is a term you should familiarize yourself with. External realism means that there is an existing world that is totally independent of human beings and of what they think or say about it. There are people that challenge external realism, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But anytime you hear external realism, you should automatically Remember that it's a belief or a theory or a background, according to Searle, you know, the framework of which we need in order to function in society at all, that there is a real world that exists totally independent of human beings and of what they think or say about it. It doesn't matter what I say about the Atlantic Ocean, it's there. It doesn't matter when I discover that there are salt particles in the Atlantic Ocean. Those salt particles existed in the Atlantic Ocean before my discovery. And then there's the correspondence theory of truth, another term you need to familiarize yourself with. The correspondence theory of truth states that statements about objects and state of affairs in the world are true or false depending upon whether the things in the world really are the way we say they are. You know, look at the boy counting marbles. If he says there are 78 marbles in that jar, he is true if there is, in fact, 78 marbles in, there, in that jar. He, he's wrong, or his statement is false, if there is 89 so the correspondence theory of truth states that truth depends upon our statements that reflect the way the real world is. If you remember, these are two labeled backgrounds from the Enlightenment vision that Searle is going to use to prove other theories but for now, it's just important for you to understand what he means by external realism and what he means when he says the correspondence theory of truth. Then Searle lists some anti-realists. George Heigl's idealism, Immanuel Kant, Descartes, perspectivism, and I might as well go into this. Heigl's idealism is the belief that reality is ultimately not a matter of something existing independent of our perceptions and other representations, but rather is constituted by our perceptions and other sorts of representations. Everything is ideas. We do not know the world unmediated. I do not know my house my desk, my TV without a mediated perspective. 
These are all ideas formed in my mind and do not exist independent of my mind. You know how they state that the real world exists independently of us? Well, idealism says the exact opposite. Because we only know the world through our ideas, we should stop arguing about an independently existing world because we only know the world dependent upon our ideas and perspective. Then there's Immanuel Kant. Kant is the one who stated that Hume awoke him from a dogmatic slumber. He's the one who states that there are two worlds, the noumena and the phenomena. The phenomenal world is the world as it's represented to us, you know, through the senses, through the mind. And there, then there's the noumena world, the world that exists inside the things themselves, the essential definitions. The noumena world is that which we do not have any access to and we can't even talk about it. And then there's Descartes, where we could be deceived by an evil demon, or we could be a brain in a jar, a brain in a vat, we could be dreaming, and so on. So we cannot trust our senses, because our senses don't give us certainty. The real world cannot be known for certain, because our only access to the real world is through a sense perception that can be deceived. And then there's perspectivism, that is a take on idealism, the idea that our knowledge is never unmediated, that it's always mediated by a point of view. So things in the world are only true by a subjective perception or by an individual's subjective perspective. But Searle says, you know, these attacks on realism, and he really has a point here because the attacks on the realist world is a kind of will to power. And the first time I heard Wheel to Power was in Friedrich Nietzsche. But regardless, the attacks on realism, according to Searle, is a will to power. Because assuming that there is no real world allows us to construct the world that we want. If the world is only known through the ideas that we have, then we're the ones who create the world. If the world is only known through our unmediated perspective, then we are the ones who give truth, who give knowledge to the world. Two plus two equals four because we say mathematically it does. The mathematics didn't exist independent of us. Our discovery created that knowledge. And he's going to attack these on the next slide because I'm going to bring up four specific challenges to realism. And we'll see how Searle says these things really don't attack realism as strong as they believe. Because, of course, you know Searle, he, he believes in realism here. And as a philosopher and scientist, he's not going to be able to just say, no, nah, these are default positions and they're the framework, so now let's move on. No, he's going to discuss the four strong challenges to realism and then show how they really don't affect realism as much as they believe because the arguments themselves could be fallible or they could rely on false premises. But in this slide, it's important to remember what he means by external realism and what he means by the correspondence theory of truth. And with that, we'll move on to the four challenges to realism. The four challenges to realism. This is after Searle lists off a bunch of challenges, and he refutes them in one or two sentences because a thorough explanation of all of the counter-arguments to realism would take an entire book by itself. But he does single out four challenges that merit more than one or two sentence rebuttals. The first one is perspectivism. And perspectivism states that we have no access to or no way of representing and by no means of coping with the real world except from a certain point of view. What this means is when we see the water, when we are driving our car, when we are watching TV, we are doing these things from our own perspective. And 
if we're going to have knowledge, it needs to be objective knowledge, not subjective knowledge. Because subjective knowledge is really not knowledge at all, if you think about it. Subjective knowledge breaks down to mere opinion. So, in order for us to have knowledge, according to those who believe in perspectivism, we need to prove we can have objective knowledge. But we can never have objective knowledge because the only way we gather knowledge is through our ideas, through our own perspective. It's never unmediated, therefore it's always subjective, and that which is always subjective can never be objective. But Searle disagrees with this. He says the entire preposition, the entire argument of perspectivism relies on the assumption that knowing reality directly as it is in itself requires that it be known from no point of view and that we need a vocabulary to describe or state facts, you know, because the vocabulary is subjective. And so the very fact that we're using a subjective language shows that we cannot know the things within themselves. But he's saying, no, just because we cannot perceive reality directly in itself doesn't mean we can't come up with objective knowledge. The fact that there is salt water in the Atlantic Ocean is a fact that existed long before there was anyone to identify the body of water as the Atlantic Ocean. You know, we subjectively identified what we call salt and what we call the Atlantic Ocean. But that doesn't take away that there is an objective Atlantic Ocean and an objective salt water content in that Atlantic Ocean. So, just because something is subjectively perceived does not mean we can't come up with objective knowledge. And in the second chapter, he really hits into this subjective and objective ontology and um, epistemic subjective and epistemic objective. I'm going to quiz you a little bit more on chapter two on that. So don't worry about that. We're really going to hit that in because that is very important with Searle. But with that, we'll move on to the second challenge, which is the conceptual relativity. He says, relativity of our concepts, relativity being that which is not a universal concept. That's what relativity is. It's relative to the individual. There is no universal concept. That's why relativism is a moral philosophy that states there is no universal morality. So anyway, relativity of our concepts, if properly understood, shows that external realism is false because we have no access to external reality except through our concepts. And this is kind of similar to the perspectivism, except they're using actual concepts within the mind. The knowledge that we come up with, the the concepts or conclusions we come to. So what they are saying is there is no fact of the matter except relative to a conceptual scheme, and therefore there is no real world except relative to a conceptual scheme. Morality and ethics, for example, here in America is different than morality and ethics in Indonesia or Africa. So what he's saying here, what the conceptual relativists are saying, is that there is no right answer because everybody has different aspects of knowledge. You know, they use different language. They use uh, different foundations. So everything is conceptually relative to your location on the earth, how much knowledge you are presented with, you know, the limited materials or resources that are available to you. And Searle says, wait a minute, I may weigh 160 pounds in one place and then 72 kilograms in another place. And that's like asking, what do I weigh? Well, I weigh both 160 pounds and 72 kilograms. The truth depends on which system of measurement we are using, but it doesn't undermine the fact that I still weigh 160 pounds. And this is quite intuitive because just because we use different languages or believe in different morals doesn't mean there might exist a universal truth. 
doesn't mean there might exist a universal set of morals. You know, just because we use two different languages doesn't mean the mathematics are incorrect. And so with that, we'll move on to the third one, the history of science. Now, the reason Searle's bringing up the history of science challenge to realism is because Searle is mainly a philosopher of science, as well as a you know, philosopher of mind and language. But he does a lot of his argumentation, especially in the, the latter chapters, based on some kind of scientific research, scientific laws, scientific modes of explaining things. So the history of science challenge states that science does not describe an independently existing reality, but is forever creating new realities as it goes along. So, science doesn't talk about an independent existing reality. What they do is they formulate new laws in order to explain newly discovered concepts. So, they're forever changing their reality. They're not explaining this independent existing reality. They're changing their arguments and forming theories based on a new reality, a new theory, a new law. But Searle states, just because they are coming up with new theories and new realities doesn't mean that they don't believe that there genuinely exists an independent reality. In fact, the presuppositions that allow them to come up with this theory are based on the fact that there is a real world. The scientists are making genuine attempts to describe this real world. So just because they are coming up with different theories to explain different realities doesn't cast doubt on the fact that there may be a real world that the scientists are trying to explain. The fourth challenge is the underdetermination of the theory of evidence, which describes, you know, we do not discover an absolute truth. Rather, we adopt a different way of thinking for essentially practical purposes. There is no such thing as truth because there's no such reality and hence no such relation of correspondence. What this means is we change our laws and theories based on what is easier to describe. We adopt different ways of talking, different scientific theories, for essentially practical purposes, for us just to make sense of the world. And yes, this argument has a strong relation to the history of science argument, but it focuses more on practical purposes. In Searle's book, he states that consider the move from the idea of the Earth as the center of our planetary system to the idea that the Sun is the center, from a geocentric to heliocentric theory. We did not discover that the Ptolemaic geocentric system was false and the heliocentric was true. We just abandoned the first because the second was simpler and and enabled us to make better predictions about eclipses, parallax, and the like. So our theories are based on practicality. They don't depend upon an independent existing world. They rely on our practicality to explain what we believe is occurring. But for Searle, he's like, no, the the heliocentric theory, the shift from geocentric to heliocentric does not show that there is no independent existing reality. On the contrary, the whole debate is only intelligible to us on the assumption that there is such a reality, that there is such a reality that we are explaining. He then concludes this section by saying, it is not up to us whether electrons or Zeus exist. What is up to us is whether we accept or reject the theory that says that they exist. The theory is true or false depending upon whether they exist or not, independently of our acceptance or rejection of the theory. So he's saying truth does not rely on what we say. Truth, the correspondence theory of truth, relies on if the world matches what we say. And that's not up to us. What's up to us is to reject the theory that says they exist. You see the difference here? 
We need to be critical of the theories that we accept. Truth or falsity rely on the world's independently existing prepositions matching our prepositions. It is only true that there are 72 marbles in a jar if my statement matches the independently existing world. That's the correspondence theory of truth. That's where truth resides. Truth doesn't only rely on our theories. Truth relies on reality matching our theories or matching our statements. And it's not up to us whether reality matches it. What's up to us is to reject the theories that say those things exist or the presuppositions that exist or the statements or premises that exist. And I hope that makes sense. That was the big conclusion to this whole section because really you do not need to remember all four challenges. This is just an example of the way Searle argues. But it is important to understand what he's saying when it comes to it's up to us whether we reject the theory that says electrons or Zeus exist. It's truth or it's falsehood depends only upon the independently existing world matching what we say, matching our statements. And Searle's not done yet. In the next section, he's going to address what he believes the big argument against external realism is. He discussed these four challenges in order to demonstrate that the correspondence theory of truth makes sense. But the next one is the main argument against external realism, and that's skepticism. Skepticism, knowledge and reality. So as I stated, Searle turns to what historically has been the main argument against the view that there's a mind-independent reality or external realism. And I bet this was in the back of your mind the entire time I was discussing Searle because skepticism is something we have discussed since Descartes and then into Hume. So now Searle addresses skepticism. First, skepticism states that Since reality exists independent of us, I mean the basis of external realism, it's therefore unknowable. There is a world of things in themselves that is forever beyond the reach of our knowledge. Even though there are many forms of skepticism, according to Searle, they all boil down to a singular claim. And that is, you could have the best possible evidence about some domain and still be radically mistaken. I can sit here and believe that I am having an experience in the external world and then I wake up. And it wasn't the external world at all. I could be dreaming. I could be having a hallucination. I could be a brain in a vat. Or I could be deceived systematically by an evil demon. How about the radical skepticism of causation? You have evidence about the past, but your claims are about the future. All you have is the events and memories that you've seen in the past, but everything you're claiming is about the future. And you can't make that claim, if you remember Hume, you can't make that claim because it relies on a uniformity principle, a uniformity principle that cannot be proven independent of experience. All of your evidence is subjective knowledge from the past. And when you start concluding about the future, you're mistaken because it's relying on the fact that the past will always conform to the future, that causes will always have uniform effects. And that's just not true. Because when you start to prove the uniformity principle, you rely on the very fact that the future will resemble the past. But Searle turns his attention on what he believes is the most important form of skepticism. He says, the example we will zero in on now is about our evidence for the existence of a real world, or as it is sometimes called, the external world. How could anyone doubt that he or she is looking at a book? What puts into doubt the fact that I am looking at a book right now? Well, the first step made by the skeptical philosopher is to press the question, What is it, strictly speaking, that you're perceiving? The fact is, you don't perceive an independently existing material object. 
You don't perceive the independent material object in an independent world. You perceive your own perception, your own conscious experience. To that, Searle states that there's no inconsistency between asserting that on one hand I directly perceive the tree or book and asserting on the other that there's a sequence of physical neurobiological events that eventually produce in me the experience I describe as seeing a tree. Just because there is a set of neurological processes that eventually produce the image doesn't mean that I don't directly perceive the tree. Now, this is the fallacious argument that he states. Just because the neurological processes are subjective to me does not mean that I do not perceive the tree. And he mentioned this with the last slide, that just because it's unmediated, just because the Atlantic Ocean was discovered by us through subjective processes doesn't mean that it does not objectively exist in the outside world. And then he turns his attention to the skeptical argument of illusion, which I believe is much more powerful. The skeptical illusion argument generally takes the form that a person who thinks that we directly perceive objects and state of affairs in the world, the naive perceptual realist, cannot deal with the fact that there is no way of distinguishing the case where I really do see the objects and state of affairs in the world, the so-called veridical case, from the case where I am having some sort of illusion, hallucination, delusion, and so on. This is the skepticism of Descartes. Therefore, perceptual realism is false because I cannot distinguish when I'm dreaming, having a hallucination, or being deceived by an evil demon. He is calling the state of affairs where I really do perceive the objects as the veridical case and the case where it could be mistaken as the illusionary or non-veridical. Now, Searle counters this in an interesting way. He says, it is simply not true that in order for me to be seeing the objects in front of me, that there must be an internal feature of experience itself that is sufficient to distinguish the veridical experience from the hallucination of the object. He says, in normal cases, I am an embodied agent engaged in all sorts of encounters with the world around me. And that it's not a singular experience. You know, any singular experience only makes the kind of sense to me that it does because it's a part of a network of other experiences. So basically, there's an assumption that I sometimes see real objects in the real world requires that there be a distinction in the qualitative character of my visual experience between the vertical and non-vertical perceptual experience. But once we reject the idea that all we ever perceive are our own perceptions, then we have no epistemic basis, no knowledge for denying external realism. He's saying that we do not see the world as a singular experience. There are trees moving, affected by the wind. There are animals roaming, affected by their own instincts. It's not a singular world. We do not have a singular world. And just to put it out there, this is not a slam dunk argument against illusion or the dream argument. This is what Searle believes is sufficient for not denying external realism. Because he's like, he's saying that there's no way we create all these things. This does not deny that there is a case of an independently existing world just because we cannot distinguish between a dream state and a viridial state. The world is a network of so many different interactions that are beyond our scope. We cannot be a singular artist in this. We are not strong enough to create this network. And more importantly, the fact that we cannot distinguish between the two doesn't deny that there is an external reality out there. So I hope you understand what he's saying here. And this is really the way... Uh, Searle attacks arguments. He will go in the background of the argument to see what they rely upon, and he will focus on that which 
does the most damage to external realism and show that it doesn't do damage to external realism or the correspondence theory of truth. And for skepticism, he attacked the main two arguments. I don't need an unmediated objective point of view to come up with objective facts. We may use subjective language like Atlantic Ocean or subjective language like salt to describe things in the outside world, but that does not mean that there doesn't exist an objective reality. And even more so, doesn't mean that we do not create an objective statement when we say there is an Atlantic Ocean or that there is salt. And for the second part, when it comes to illusions, just because I cannot distinguish between being awake or being asleep, doesn't mean that the real world or external realism doesn't exist. The real world is a network full of so many different variables that I cannot be the author of it, or even more so that the fact that I can't distinguish between the awake or sleep doesn't mean that there exists this external world. Because the external world isn't known by a singular experience. When you sleep, that's a singular experience. When you're awake, it's not a singular experience. So just because I cannot distinguish between the two doesn't mean there isn't an external reality. And with that, we'll move on to the final part where he describes or asks the question, is there any justification for external realism? Is there any justification for external realism? Searle starts this chapter by saying, you know, he's been answering challenges to external realism, but can external realism be justified on its own? Searle flat out says that he does not believe it makes sense to ask for a justification of a view that there is a way that things are in the world independently of our representation. Because any attempts at justification presupposes what it attempts to justify. If I ask, all right, is that car actually there? What I'm attempting to justify is, is there a car that exists in the independent world? I can say, no, it's just my idea of the car, or I could be dreaming about the car, or things of that nature, but I'm still presupposing that there is a world where a car would exist. It still presupposes that there is some type of world out there where a car could be in my garage. It presupposes a way things are, even when it tries to negate the way things are. And that's why he says it's wrong to represent external realism as a view, or even as a theory, because it's not a theory. It is a framework that is necessary for it to be even possible to hold opinions or theories about such things as planetary movements or the way the world is. You know, when you debate the merits of a theory, you have to take for granted that there is a way that things really are. It's not a theory like mind and body dualism where you can find out that, hey, maybe everything is in fact material and that there does not exist a non-material mind. You know, that's a theory. But external realism, the fact that there is an independently existing world... That is a foundation that's necessary for you to have opinions at all. Searle states that those who denied external realism were just trying to assume a will to power, that we are the power in the world, that reality itself is just a social construct. That's the deep motivation for denying realism or saying that it's not an argument. They're trying to create a world that they see fit. It's a desire for control. But external realism isn't a matter of opinion. It is not a theory to be argued. It is the framework necessary for us to have opinions or theories at all. Now, if Searle just stated this at the beginning of the book and then went on to the next chapter, there would be a problem. It would be dismissed in the philosophical community. It wouldn't be 
taken seriously. But the fact is, is he's already shown that the main arguments against realism fall by the waistline. You know, they don't hold up or deny external realism or an independently existing reality. So he's done his work. Now he's just showing that external realism is not a theory or opinion that's up for debate. Because for humans to have theories or opinions at all, we need to presuppose that there is an external reality, that there is something out there that we can hold dear, that we can have opinions about. And so there is a need for a justification of external realism. External realism is not a theory. It's the framework that's necessary for us to even hold opinions or theories. And that ends this chapter. The next chapter, he's going to go heavy into the mind and body dualism and subjective and objective ontology. And ontology simply means existence. Epistemic means knowledge or knowledge of. But as usual... Do the discussion post, post a response, and finish the quiz before Sunday at midnight. Have a great day.